Ah, I got it to work. All right, so let me tell you what we're going to do. Uh, that was a bit of a struggle on my part, trying to get this thing going. Oh my goodness, you don't even know. Okay, um, uh, so I'm Mike Winger, and this is the Tuesday live stream where we tackle issues of theology and apologetics. And today, today we're dealing with this article called Six and a Half Reasons Why the Bible is Not Divinely Inspired. And so we're going to tackle this article, we're going to handle the reasons that it gives one at a time, and we're going to respond to those reasons. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining me and welcome to the live stream. If you are watching live, today is uh, Tuesday, April 10th, 2018. And you can actually put your questions in the live comments and then my friend AJ, he's going to send those questions to me through a private message. So I will isolate your questions and answer them at the end of the stream. So please go ahead and load those questions in and we will um, we will be good to go. So here we are. This is what we're going to cover today. This is a article on the website called Pethos. And this is, I think it's .com or .org. Uh, anyway, the Friendly Atheist website. And the article is this. Six and a half reasons, they say, why the Bible is not divinely inspired. So you, this is not my article, rather, this is someone else's article. I'm going to cover this and I'm going to go through it because I think this article is a really good example of the kind of stuff that skeptics put online. Again, I'm generalizing here, so not all, this doesn't fit all skeptics, but I have spent years hearing and seeing the online attacks against the Bible. And this is a good representation of a lot of the kind of stuff that you get in the chat rooms and on Facebook and on YouTube and in the different uh, social medias that you get, you know, and, and into, into conversations too. guys, you just meet at a coffee shop and talk with, they'll bring up these issues. So um, this website in particular, this, this article has 15,000 shares, over 15,000 shares. So that's quite a few. It's been carried on multiple websites. And too often, in my opinion, these attacks against the Bible go unanswered. What happens is there's attacks against the Bible that are often, um, they're not rational or they're not entirely reasonable, but they go unanswered because frequently when someone attacks the Bible, the person hearing it isn't, you know, equipped to handle it. Maybe doesn't feel like arguing with the person they're, They've never heard that before. They haven't had a chance to think it through and they're kind of nervous, especially in our culture in America. They're very nervous to talk about disagreements about any religious type issue. So they go, ha, 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 you know, and then it goes unanswered, which leaves that person feeling like those attacks are true. Well, we're going to answer those attacks today. Um, cause this stuff stirs me up. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I started making videos online was feeling like a lot of this stuff, these attacks come and they're unanswered. So let's just read through the article and take them one answer at a time to each of the issues that's brought up. He says, uh, what would it take for me to consider converting to Christianity? Simple, incontrovertible proof of God. A lot of Christians are fond of saying that all the proof we need is right there in the Bible, but I've read the so-called good book and I see zero evidence of divinity. In fact, reading the Bible only served to convince me further that Christianity is a house of cards with a biblical foundation that is full of mystifying holes and fissures. Matt, a former evangelical Christian who now writes at Southern Skeptic, that, that would be an, an additional website that, that they, this person got the article from and then adapted it for Patheos. But, that, but Patheos, this website has more, uh, more pull and more draw, more tension, so I'm focusing on this one. Um, so Matt recently asked what we would expect to find in a book that was either written by God or divinely inspired. He's come up with seven. Okay, six and a half. Excellent answers. First of all, I'll just mention that the Bible, uh, we don't think was written by God, right? <laughs> this is this is not the careful, thoughtful answer that Christians give. It's not, the, it's not just accurate to what the scripture declares. The Bible's inspired. So people, human beings wrote with some sort of inspiration or guidance or leading by God, but it wasn't dictation. It was inspiration. So let's go into these actual things, the issues. The first one is this. The Bible would be well organized. This uh, this skeptic attack is the Bible would be well organized. Um, so if, if it was inspired, it would be well organized. But it isn't, they write. It's a hopeless me mess. Matt <laughs> writes Matt. Hopeless mess. That's now pause for a second. For skeptics, when you when you describe the Bible with pejorative statements like like that, it's a hopeless mess. For someone who knows the scriptures fairly well, it comes up, it comes across like prejudicial attitude. It's kind of like the way people talk about groups when they hate those groups or they can't stand those groups. It's the way that really, really staunch 
people in one side of the political spectrum talk about people in the other side and they're marginalizing them and they're misrepresenting them. So just, just to point that out. Now he says, there could be a book about God's creation. Here's his idea of how the Bible should be organized. A book about God's creation, a book about love and relationships, a book about parenting, a book about prayer, a book about spirituality, a book about managing churches, a book about morality, and so forth. You know, a well thought out user's guide to life. Instead, Christians are forced to flip back and forth through thousands of pages, piecing together little bits of information here and there with the help of concordances. Um, okay, so is this, is this a reasonable thing? Well, first off, I need to point out that this is kind of an anachronistic view of the Bible. Um, what am I saying? Uh, that when I look at the Bible and I view it as though it should be written for a modern 21st century human being, like exclusively, and that's what this whole list is going to do. This list is going to basically say, here's Matt going, look, I want the Bible to be written, but I don't want it to be written for all people of all time. I want it to be written for me, 21st century Matt. That's what I want it to be written for. English speaking, 21st century, maybe American Matt. That, that, that's what I'm, I'm gearing my, my desires for. Um, but the Bible, if it is a, a book given by God to all of mankind, then it is written for the 21st century, the 20th, 19th, 18th, the Bronze Age. It's written for all people of all time. And so the organization of the book is probably going to reflect that. Now, this, this issue will come up again. So when I mention an anachronistic view or um, a very selfish kind of narrow-minded, and I don't mean this, in, it sounds really insulting, but I really don't mean it in that sense. But when I'm asking, am, am I asking, uh, was the Bible written and inspired rather by God for mankind? Or am I asking, was the Bible inspired for me? Because there's a big difference between the two and we're just smart to point out the difference. So the question here is, uh, why isn't the Bible organized? Why isn't the Bible organized? I have so many problems already with number one. I'm just gonna point them out kind of systematically here. First off, the Bible's organized. I mean, it is organized. It's not a disorganized mess. Like the Quran is, is, is very disorganized. I mean, for the most part, the, the surahs, the chapters of the Quran are organized by size, right? The bigger ones going down to the smaller ones. Um, imagine if you organized the Bible that way, everything was just organized by size. That would be a little confusing. And there, there isn't books of the Quran. There's just individual chapters and they don't necessarily connect a storyline or anything like that. And they're very occasional. Um, it could be better organized. But we're not really talking here about the order of the books because the order of the books of the Bible is irrelevant because th that's not inspired, right? Like the books are inspired, the writings are inspired, but the order in which we place them is not. The The Jews have a slightly different order for the Old Testament than we do. Um, the you could, you could take your Bible and you could jumble up the order. That, that's irrelevant. So the question is, is there organization in the actual books? And I would say yes. He mentions a book about creation, love, relationships, parenting, prayer, spirituality, managing churches. That's funny because, okay, a book about God's creation. So we have Genesis. A book about love and relationships. Well, we have the Song of Solomon. We have whole sections in uh, Proverbs dealing with that as well. Book of a book about parenting he would like. Well, we have whole sections organized about parenting. We have stuff in Proverbs, but we also have whole sections in First Timothy and Colossians and Ephesians specifically for parents and on the topic of parenting. Um, a book about prayer. I mean, that, that's the book of Psalms. Psalms is a book about prayer. Uh, a book about spirituality. Well, that's kind of the Bible in general. So that doesn't really narrow it to one book in particular. That's the whole thing. A book about managing churches. He says that would be nice. Well, we have that. That's First and Second Timothy and Titus. That's why we we call those the pastoral epistles because they're they're specifically about managing churches. Uh, they continue have a lot of that content. Then he mentions a book about morality. Um, oh, Matthew chapters five through eight, the Sermon on the Mount, considered one of the best moral treatises of all time, given by Jesus. And so we have other content as well in other places. I don't. I now I don't know if you can complain that morality is also mentioned in Proverbs. It's also mentioned in Genesis. It's also mentioned in Exodus. It's also mentioned in, in other places. Uh, morality is important. It touches many different places in the Bible, but there are sections that deal with it more in a more focused way as well. So the Bible is organized, but ignoring all this, um, Matt says, instead, Christians are forced to flip back and forth through the thousands of pages of scripture, piecing together little bits of information here and there with the help of concordances. Now you can flip all over the place and learn more and have a more rounded and more full view of things. But the, like, here's my question is, how does this even relate to the inspiration of scripture? Like, 
this is a terrible way of testing for inspiration. Number one, I would never say if a book's really well organized, maybe it's inspired by God. Because if that's the case, then like my the phone book, the phone book must be inspired by God. This is weird because, I mean, hear me out. This is not a good reason to even think about inspiration. Organization doesn't equal inspiration. Organization is just useful. It equals a sense of utility for certain purposes. Um, it's just not a good reason to believe that it's from God. And so number one, if it's not a good reason to believe, if organization is not a good reason to believe the Bible is inspired, then disorganization wouldn't be a good reason to believe it's not. It's just irrelevant. It's a side issue. Um, it also has that anachronistic view. Of course, laws for Israel are well organized in the text, but that's not relevant to Matt because Matt's interested only in 21st century non-Jewish concerns, which is unfortunate because um, to fully understand the revelation in scripture, you need to take the whole thing. All right, let's take number two. Number two, Matt says, and, and, if, and if you have challenges, uh, questions, even differences of opinion, please put those in the comments section and uh, AJ will send those to me. At the end of this live stream, I will take your questions. Just load them into the comments now and I'll answer them uh, later. Number two, number two, the Bible would be, quote, more specific, more specific if it was inspired, according to, to Matt. They say, need practical life advice delivered with clarity? Keep looking. Imagine how convenient it would be if one of the books of the Bible was called Morality, and it had a different chapter for each area of morality. What if there were a chapter on murder that clearly describes all the various scenarios where killing is permitted? War, execution, self-defense, etc. When it comes to good practical advice that we can apply to our daily lives, the Bible falls short. So the Bible falls short because it's not specific enough. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, follow with me here if you can. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. I'm laughing because it's it's silly, okay? And it's a little bit funny. Um, it's an incredibly vague accusation about the Bible not being specific enough. I mean, t for, for what Matt is saying here, this skeptical attack on the Bible, what it's saying is the Bible's not specific enough, therefore it's not inspired. And all I can say is, can you please be more specific? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Like you're, you're proving non-inspiration through lack of specificity. Okay, so the irony is that the complaint is so vague. Um, what is the complaint really about? It goes on to explain specificity, but the only example given is an organized section on practical advice or morality. Um, so that just, you know, again, this is not about specificity. That's about utility. It's not saying the Bible's not specific enough. Ultimately, the example is about utility. I don't think the Bible's useful enough when it comes to issues like morality or, um, parenting advice, that sort of thing. Um, okay. I, I, I disagree. Uh, I, I don't think this even matters. This is, this is, again, this is another red herring. So number one was a red herring. Number two is a red herring. It means it's a, it's a side issue unrelated to the actual issue of inspiration. We'll get there later. Uh, he'll actually talk about the real issue of inspiration in number, uh, I believe it's number five or number six or number five and six. Those are the real issues, but let's cover these in order. According to this uh, skeptic, the Bible does not have practical advice. What about the book of Proverbs? I mean, I, I'm doing a whole series, weekly series right now on YouTube called Wisdom in the Word. And in this series, we take, I mean, I'll, I just open Proverbs or open the scriptures and I start just looking for little pieces of practical advice. And then I do like a really short little video on it. Like for instance, how to stop arguments before they start. Like real super practical advice on how to stop an argument before it starts. How to deal with laziness. The Bible gives us practical advice on controlling your anger. These are all videos I've, I've got up on my YouTube page under the playlist Wisdom in the Word. Um, uh, not co-signing a loan. Like the Bible has practical advice. Don't co-sign loans, guys. This is not wise. You want to give money, give money, but don't co-sign. Um, how to make tough decisions in life in general. Marriage advice. In fact, marriage, I would say it's the being a married guy, right? I would say this is the best advice. The advice that... God gives for marriage for husbands. It guides and changes my actions all the time, all the time. I'm constantly listening to what scripture tells me about how to love my wife and uh, lay down my, my needs for her needs and put her first. I'm constantly listening to this. The marriage advice in the Bible is like put to the test and create successful marriages. I've never met a single married couple who says the husband does what the Bible says. The wife does what the Bible says and their marriage is falling apart. I've never seen it. Um, Parenting advice. The, the, the Bible has great parenting advice as well. It tells fathers not to provoke their children to wrath. Oh, what genius advice this is. 
Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Like you have this powerful authority in their lives. Don't abuse it and drive them towards anger and bitterness towards you. Like this is such good. I mean, that's just good stuff. Um, anyway, it, it goes on. The Bible has more content on that. But he, but he then adds, in addition to saying a lack of practical advice, which the Bible has, then he says, what if there were a chapter on murder that clearly describes all the various scenarios where killing is permitted? War, execution, self-defense, etc. Okay, well, uh, here, let me, I'll show you again that, that page towards the bottom there. He's like, what if there was a chapter on that? Um, okay, so does the Bible talk about killing? Yes. Does it talk about murder? Yes. Does it differentiate between the two? Yes. Does it teach uh, about and not only giving teaching about it, but specific real life examples about killing in war, capital punishment, self-defense, manslaughter versus murder, criminal neglect? Yes, 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 yes. It actually deals with all of those topics. Um, the only complaint that Matt could have here is that the Bible doesn't do all of it in one chapter alone. Okay, so the Bible is organized. It's just not organized in the way you want it to be. Does that mean it's not inspired or are you just being entitled? I mean, that's, that's all I, I can see with that because that again ignores what the Bible is. Yeah, it's not all in one chapter. Okay, but it's childish to just demand it's all in one chapter. You know, mom, I would have listened to your instructions, but you wrote it on more than one paper. Like, so I'm ignoring you. I don't really think you wrote it then. It doesn't make sense. Um, but this flies in the face of other skeptical attacks because I've heard skeptics say over and over again, we don't need the Bible for morality. So why, why would he come against the Bible for not having more specificity when it comes to morals and moral behavior? When on the other hand, I'm pretty sure Matt would be one of the skeptics who would say, we don't need the Bible for morality. We could figure it out all on our own. So that seems to me that you pick one or the other, but don't try to have both those accusations. Um, so my conclusions for this one is this, um, it's a very unspecific request for specificity, which is really about utility and organization, but in fact is discounted when you compare it to the scripture like this. Number two, the Bible should be more specific. That falls short. It falls flat. It's, um, it's irrelevant. And don't get mad at me if, you, if, if the examples of skeptics are bad. Like if you have better examples, put them in the comments, put, make a video response and I will watch your video. I might even take the time to uh, do a thing on what you do. Um, give your, your best, your best reasoning, you know, but this is an atheist, a popular website making a case against the Bible. So we're going to tackle it. So here's number three, the Bible would be easy to understand. Um, the Bible would be easy to understand. Now, do we think things that are easy to understand are automatically inspired? No. Like, do you think Dr. Seuss's works are inspired because they're easy to understand? One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Maybe it's inspired. I mean, I, it's pretty basic. I, I understand it very well. Um, there was an old lady who swallowed a spider. It wiggled and jiggled and wriggled inside her. Wow, that, that that's pretty clear. But we don't think it's inspired. So again, we have a bad test for inspiration. But it's, it's basically a way to take a pot shot at the Bible. So it would be easy to understand, they say. To some extent, this goes back to one and two. The Bible is cryptic and open to roughly 41,000 interpretations that we know of. We're going to tackle this. Because here, this is a link, in case you, can, you can't see, there's underlined, there are 41,000 interpretations. That's underlined and underlined for a purpose. This is a link that takes you to a Wikipedia article where they offer up the 41,000 interpretations. Think about this quote. I want you to read how he wrote it, not how I'm phrasing it, right? The Bible is cryptic. Cryptic means it's, it's, you can't understand it. And it's speaking about the Bible as a whole. And, and it's, then the second accusation, the Bible is open to 41,000 interpretations that there are uniquely different 41 grand interpretations on the Bible. Now this would shock theologians who didn't realize that there were wholesale interpretations of the entire Bible that were uniquely different that are 41,000 in number. Um, I'm not aware of such a thing, but what does the link say? Well, when you click on the link to back up this, 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 uh, for, with evidence, it's a Wikipedia article. Now, most of us nowadays realize that Wikipedia is an interesting source and it's a source that we all look at at least casually, but it's not good for making well thought out, careful cases for things because of the following, right? They click on the, you click on the Wikipedia article, it takes you to what is called a list of Christian denominations. Now, denominations are those interpretations. No, 
A denomination is not an interpretation. This is a list of Christian denominations. This article further has issues. In fact, Wikipedia has a disclaimer on the cover of the article. It says, this article has multiple issues. Please help improve it or discuss these. Then it lists the issues. The neutrality of this article is disputed. The examples and perspective in this article may not represent a worldwide view on the subject. Number three, this article needs additional citations for ver uh, verification. It says citation needed over and over through the article. And then finally, this article's factual accuracy is disputed, which would be the biggest probably issue with the article. But all that set aside, the article is not about interpretations. It's about denominations. And even, even so, it's a bad article about denominations. If you go and flip through the article, you'll see that this Wikipedia article has somewhere near maybe a thousand or less denominations that it lists, not 41,000 interpretations. Where is this number coming from? Like, can you guys help me out? I don't mean off the top of your head. Somebody find a source for 41,000 interpretations of the Bible that have enough legitimacy to them to be considered an, an like a viable interpretation of the Bible, not just a passage. I mean, I've got, if I have more than 41,000 words, then I can have 41,000 in different interpretations of those words, but of the Bible as a whole, that it just boggles the mind that this made it past multiple like checks and balances to get into be an article on multiple websites, get shared when it has this kind of content on it. Um, the Wikipedia article, this actually article, one of the, just on this as a side note, one of the problems with it, it includes in its list of maybe around a thousand denominations. I started to count, I lost count and I just, I just guesstimated maybe a thousand denominations. Um, it includes in those as le legitimate denominations of Christianity, the, the Mormon church, the Jehovah's witnesses, the world mission society, church of God. Do you remember the mother God video I did? They're considered by this Wikipedia article, that crazy theology is considered Christian by this article. Um, and voodoo, voodoo is considered Christian, a Christian denomination, voodoo, along with a whole bunch of others that are just way out there. So the article's obviously a bad source, but yet it is the source uh, quoted here in number um, three, the Bible should be easy to understand, but instead it's cryptic and it's open to 41,000 different interpretations. Yeah, not true. Um, obviously the Bible may have some spots that are difficult to understand, but it has others that are very clear. And, um, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I was reading the comments. I have to not read the comments while I'm doing the live stream. So, um, let's read on. It says, if God wants his message to be understood by everyone, then even simple minded people should be able to understand his book as it is experts in theology. Now here's, here's the example that, that, that simple minded people can't understand the Bible. Experts in theology have been debating the exact meaning of many passages for centuries. So this is um, the fallacy of equivocation, right? He, he takes the Bible as a whole, is cryptic, subject to countless interpretations, and simple people can't understand the Bible as a whole. That's the context of this, this number three. Then at the very end, the final example to support this takes pieces of the Bible and conflates them to be the Bible as a whole. Because expert in, experts in theology debating the exact, many, the exact meaning of certain passages in the Bible doesn't mean that the Bible as a whole is cryptic. This, this is pretty simple stuff. But if you conflate like, oh gosh, what is the exact meaning of I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Like, what is the exact, exact meaning of that? We can debate that all day, but the general meaning of it is, is, is understood pretty clearly, right? I, I'm alive in Christ. I mean, Christ is my life. I mean, the simple-minded person would take it simply and be, and be totally fine getting it. So this is just, look, you're just not being honest with the information. It, there's, there's, there's logical fallacies embedded in these supposed reasons why the Bible is not inspired. And so I don't think we should uh, take them seriously. But I'm also puzzled because so far we've had three reasons, right? Three reasons. The Bible's not organized enough. It's not specific enough. And it's not easy enough to understand. All three of those are not true, but that's not the point. How are any of these a test for inspiration? You don't test for inspiration based upon 
is it organized well? Is it really specific? And is it easy to understand? Because it, it needs to be more than what I get out of Dr. Seuss. It needs to be more than what I get out of the phone book. If you're going to show inspiration, none of those things are going to be the test for it. So let's look at number four. Numero cuatro. It says, I, it would be perfectly consistent. The Bible, if it was inspired by God, would be perfectly consistent. And this is a hobby horse for uh, Bible critics, for sure. Uh, many Bible critics. But it doesn't really belong on this list. But we'll talk about it, because there it is. So it would be perfectly consistent. Uh, what's he talking about? Contradictions. So he says, no dice on that score either. What does an all-powerful writer need? An all-powerful editor, apparently. When God spoke through his Holy Ghost... Uh, one of his angels should have spoken up and said, hey, you might want to fix some of those contradictions. I mean, come on, there are hundreds of them. Notice the link. So this is actually a link to a list of contradictions, supposed contradictions that you find on the Skeptics Annotated Bible website. Um, I, I like blotched out a uh, an advertisement that's there. I don't want to be posting some ad for some reason. But, um, but yeah, this is the list of contradictions. And here's the first three, but there's hundreds on the Skeptics Annotated Bible. Now, let me just say, I, I actually, I have three videos online that deal with multiple dozens of these contradictions, many that appear on this exact list. And so I, I've, I've put the, the, um, the link to that video set in the video description on this video. So you can, you can go, in fact, in the video description, you can look at um, the link for the original article, the one that I'm exposing and dealing with. You can also find links to my evidence for the Bible series, the whole playlist, as well as just the contradictions videos, as well as I think a couple other things I put in there as well. So that's all down there. Um, now the problem with contradictions is this. Um, contra when, when, you, when you bring up contradictions and then you want to answer them, you've got to understand one thing before, before you start. And this is the thing you have to understand. Answers are more complicated than questions. Like this is, this is simple, right? Answers are more complex than questions. I can ask a question. What's the meaning of life? The answer to that question will be somewhat complicated. I can ask a hundred questions in a row or hundreds in the case of the contradictions list. And if I expect the every answer to be as short as the question, then I will have self con I've, I will self confirm my own opinion. Uh, my own point. And the more questions I ask, the longer you have to answer. So if you're the skeptic out there who thinks the fact that Christians have to labor at explaining contradictions proves that there are contradictions, then you don't understand how reality works. Like you ask questions, you give answers, answers take longer than questions. That's why during a Q&A, you don't have like equal time for questions and equal time for answers. You got like a 30 second question, a four minute answer, a 20 second question, a three minute answer. So this is basic stuff, right? This is, <laughs> but sometimes we need to go back to the basics. So what are these contradictions? Well, um, I'm a big fan of thinking slowly about something. Uh, I, I don't like being caught out as foolish. I like to think and prepare before I share stuff with you. Hopefully everything I say today is something I've actually thought about, planned out, considered, thought what would be the flaw in that, what would be wrong with that before I say it out loud. And that's something that we should do, especially if we're going to talk about God's word. Um, so... How will we handle these contradictions? Um, well, for one, a contradiction has to be an actual contradiction, right? It, it can't just be a difference. Differences are not contradictions. That should be obvious. It also has to go back to the original text, the original writings of the Bible. So if you show me two copies and they don't agree, okay, those are copies. They don't agree. That's kind of expected. But that's not a contradiction that we talk about when dealing with inspiration. Um, but the but the lists on the internet of contradictions, they abound. And the longer the lists are, the worse they are, and the more reckless they are with reality. This particular list might seem daunting to a believer, um, but like how many men did the chief of David's captains kill? I actually deal with this issue in my Evidence for the Bible series when I talk about manuscripts. Um, number two, was Abraham justified by faith or works? We dealt with that a couple weeks ago when we when we took it took on James chapter two and just just read it in context, read it carefully, and it, the question is fully answered right there in the context of the passage. Um, he, he was justified by faith uh, in the sense of salvation. He was given um, it was that justification or that that evidence of salvation was made clear to us by his works, and so um, how many sons did Abraham have? That one's kind of funny because Abraham he had. Uh, Isaac's called his one and only son. That was as a title. Um, he had Ishmael, he had Isaac, and then 
he went on to have other kids later, years later. Uh, but Isaac's called his one and only son because prophetically and basically prophetically God's like, he's the son of the promise. He's the one and only son of the promise. That's the idea. Anyway, I mean, but th this stuff is, I'm not special pleading. I'm not, it's just, that's handling it fairly. You can go through the hundreds of lists, but here's what I've learned. The psychological power of contradictions is much more important than the actual contradictions themselves. This is why skeptics will so often attack the Bible with really bad examples of contradictions. And I mean, well-known skeptics, right? The, the contradictions supposed by Bart Ehrman um, or Dan Barker, I deal with those in my Evidence for the Bible series. They give lame examples, but it doesn't matter because to them, it's about how many examples they can give, right? So um, instead of giving you one powerhouse contradiction, like this absolutely proves the Bible's contradicting, I'll give you 50 lame examples, but the sheer number of them is daunting. I mean, for a believer to think I have to tack to, track down each one of these one at a time. And then I go to the atheist and I give him an answer and he just laughs at me and gives me another one. And he says, ah, if that's, that verse doesn't work, I'll just give you another, which is exactly what every cult group I know does with the Bible. They don't care what it really says. They just care that they have a bag full of verses they can throw at you. And when you answer it, they just throw another one instead of saying, oh, you're right. I won't use that one again. Because no matter how wrong the contradictions are proven to be, the list never changes. It always stays the same. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. The list never gets smaller when they, when they say, wow, there's really good answers for these supposed contradictions. Keep them on the list anyways, because it's really a numbers game. Um, for the skeptic, it gives them security. When they examine the contradictions, they seem to be good answers for them, but I've got hundreds of them, so I'm sure I'm safe in saying the Bible's contradicted. For the believer, it's a daunting task for them to answer all these hundreds of contradictions, which is why some apologists actually avoid even dealing with the issue of contradictions, uh, not because they think the Bible is contradicting, but because it feels to them like a waste of time. Uh, I can answer that contradiction. You'll just ignore me and bring up another. So they tend to avoid it because it's such a large time consuming thing. But that's why I did tackle this issue in my evidence for the Bible series. Um, Now, let's, let's take a hypothetical. Let's say that number three was real, hypothetically, and that the Bible really does have um, contradictions. I'm sorry, is it? Yeah, number four. The Bible really has contradictions, that this list on skeptics annotated Bible is fully legit and it really is full of contradictions. Um, here's the question, hypothetically, what does this mean in regards to the inspiration of scripture? Does it mean God did not inspire people to write in the Bible? No. Now, I, I don't believe there's any contradictions in the Bible, but this is on a list that's meant to show the Bible's not inspired, right? Except a contradiction within the Bible would not prove the Bible's not inspired. It would, it would honestly, it, because it won't take away the reasons for believing the Bible is inspired, which is going to be prophecy and knowledge that comes from heaven, basically from the mind of God, not man. It won't take that away. Like you still have that there. So you have that and you have contradictions. How do you reconcile the two is the question. And what some people do is they just say, wow, I think that maybe there are contradictions. I just think that the Bible's more about the theological point and God just didn't care about two of these random details being perfectly the same. Instead, he guided the writers towards other purposes. Now, I don't like that. I don't believe that, but it's a possibility that would explain all the evidence if the Bible had contradictions, meaning that even as a believer, um, if I were to come across contradictions that were not reconcilable, it would not cause me to abandon my faith in Christ or in the Bible for that matter. Um, it would cause me to question what I mean when I say the Bible is inspired and inerrant. Um, although that's hypothetical, uh, I'm not leaning that way. I'm not personally inclined to that at all. I only bring that up because I'm trying to answer these these reasons one at a time. So far, not a single one, one, two, three, and four, not one of them is even if it were true, if even if it were true, not one of them is a reason to disbelieve the inspiration of scripture. So let's get to number five because number five is. So number five is this, that the Bible would have specific verifiable prophecies. You like this cup, by the way, this is a little, little free advertisement. I'm not actually selling these. I just wanted to show it to you. <laughs> my wife got me this for my, uh, for my birthday or Christmas. I forget which one they're like a day apart. So, um, one of the, one of the other, anyway, my coffee cup makes me happy. 
So number five is that the Bible would have specific verifiable prophecies. And here I go, applause to you, Matt. You are thinking very clearly. You are coming right down to brass tacks to like the important issues. This is actually evidence for the Bible being inspired. This hits the nail on the head. If the Bible has verifiably got fulfilled prophecy in it, then we can trust that there's inspiration beyond the mind of man. And it is in fact from God. And I, I think that's very reasonable to say that. So let's tackle this issue because we finally hit something that's worth talking about. Um, he says, it would name with specificity certain crucial events that happened hundreds or thousands of years after the Bible was written. Maybe the Crusades or the atomic bomb or the moon landings. Now, let me just pause for a second. When he says after the Bible was written, um, I can't be certain that the author here actually knows that the Bible is consists of, you know, like 66 different documents that were written over hundred and hundreds and hundreds of years by different authors. That's important to know because if you have a prophecy in Genesis and then it's fulfilled in between Malachi and Matthew, you know, in between the new and old Testament, then it's still prophecy hundreds of years after the fact. So it would still be valid prophecy, but maybe Matt thinks that the whole Bible, like you can't have pro fulfilled prophecy till after the first century AD, because that's when the whole Bible had been completed, but that's, uh, that wouldn't be uh, reasonable. So I just throw that out there for anybody who might be uh, confused on that topic. It says, maybe the Crusades, let's read this again. Maybe the Crusades or the atomic bomb or the moon landing. A clear mention of world changing discoveries and technologies would be nice. The printing press say, or the fact that the earth revolves around the sun or flying machines or penicillin. Such predictions would go a long way to establishing divine origin. But then here's what he says the Bible actually contains. He says, instead, biblical prophecies are feeble in the extreme, feeble in the extreme. And now you need to hear his examples because what you're about to hear is how Matt mischaracterizes the Bible. And we're going to deal with this. And, and if you're a skeptic and you want to agree with Matt, I only ask that you clearly understand me, um, that you listen to enough of what I say that you won't pull it apart and disassemble it till I'm an incoherent mess inside your head. Uh, because you're challenging every other word that comes out of my mouth. I ask you to hear me out. This is a twisting of the Bible completely. He says, you would expect the prophecies to be specific and not subject to interpretation. Okay. Pause. <laughs> Can you guys think of anything that's not subject to interpretation? Like anything? Anything. There is nothing. Nothing that can't be argued about by people. Like this is, this, this is reality. You know, we, this is the world we live in. You can argue about anything. Everything has to be interpreted. The phrase not subject to interpretation is subject to interpretation. And so, yeah, anytime there's communication or experiential input, I have to interpret the thing. So that's not reasonable to say. Um, but then he says, wars and rumors of wars is not a good prophecy. That's the example of not a good prophecy. What is that from? Wars and rumors of wars. And you may have heard this if you're like, if, if, if basically the most ex exposure you have to God's word has been like in the left behind movies. Okay. If that's the most exposure, then you, then maybe you think that wars and rumors of wars is prophecy. But when you read this in context, here's what Jesus said when he used the phrase wars and rumors of wars, Matthew 24, six. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Here's the context of Jesus saying wars and rumors of wars. Jesus is saying this, not prophecy. Like, yes, wars, I'm telling you they'll happen, but don't let it bother you. That's not the point. That's not the thing you look for. Why? Why was Jesus not satisfied with wars and rumors of wars as being a prophetic fulfillment because it's too generic, it's non-specific, and it's something that's going to happen anyways throughout time. So his example of bad prophecy is actually Jesus's example of bad prophecy. <laughs> this is so cool to me because really Jesus agrees here with Matt. <laughs> when you think about it. So let's look at this again. It says, um, the Bible would have something better than wars and rumors of wars. Okay. 
Um, Because that's not a good prophecy. That's what Matt says. And Jesus agrees. In fact, the Bible does have prophecy that is specific and that is fulfilled. And that's why in my evidence for the Bible series, I have 10 videos dealing with prophetic fulfillment from the Old Testament. Specifically starting with the whole case. Why should we trust in prophecy as as a case for the Bible? And then specific ones where I try to tackle skeptics' objections to those in the course of going through them so that I'm trying to give both sides and give a good case, uh, the best I can, the best case I know how to give for prophecy. Someone else could probably do better, but, um, and they should. If you could do better, do it, please. We need more of this, but it's beautiful evidence. Now in the Bible though, here's some stuff to understand. Um, There's short-term and long-term prophecy. So short-term prophecy would have a function, long-term would have another function. And short-term prophecy is good for the people who originally received the reading, but it doesn't help me. Hundreds and hundreds of years later, I don't have the discernment to know that that was fulfilled shortly after. I want a bigger space of time between the prediction and the fulfillment. So that's long-term prophecy. Now that doesn't do a lot of help for the person receiving the book originally, but it helps later readers of the Bible. And so God has both in the Bible to help all people. And not all prophecy is equally useful for this, right? Some prophecies are just to teach us things or to help us for when we're in that moment that we look back and go, oh, I get it. Um, But some prophecy is very useful for this. Video number two in my series, Evidence for the Bible. Video two, teaching number two, it's about Ezekiel's prophetic description of how the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, will be destroyed and how it was fulfilled, you know, generations later by Alexander the Great. And it is really neat. I mean, the the specificity of it is really cool. Um, Alexander the Great was going to come and he ends up fulfilling it. He takes the city and throws it into the ocean. He throws the city into the ocean in order to build a a causeway to get to uh, an island where people were hiding out, which is just, it's fulfilled in secular history. It's it's not even a question as to whether it was fulfilled. Um, People just debate on what it means (laughs) that, that it's, that it so sounds just like what Ezekiel wrote. So I'd encourage you to check out that series. Number five, it's the nail on the head. Matt's right. We absolutely should uh, believe the Bible based upon that. So that's the one time where I go, yep, that is evidence. And guess what? The Bible has it. Then we get to number six. Number six is that the Bible would contain knowledge that humans could not have had. And dare I say, that's the same as number five. Um, Number five was prophecy. Number six is knowledge that humans couldn't have. That's Okay, that's why prophecy is interesting. That's why prophecy is evidence is because it's information humans can't have about the future. Um, so I have a problem with, with five and six being different numbers. They're the same thing. But let's read on because he has some points he's going to make. He says, this is the most powerful argument of all to me, which I agree. It's number five. Um, it's almost as if everything in the Bible were written by Iron Age humans with Iron Age understanding of how the world works. Go figure. Well, We wouldn't just, Christians wouldn't dispute that actually (laughs) at all. (laughs) Like we would say, that's important that you know that. So you read the Bible thoughtfully. Um, But let's read on. He says, imagine if there were a Bible verse that said, for the pieces that make up our Lord's creation behave as both particles and waves existing everywhere and nowhere. So this would be a Old Testament or Bible prediction that about quantum mechanics that we've only very recently discovered. Um, or quantum physics or something along those lines. I won't pretend I'm an expert in that because I'm not. Uh-uh. <laughs> and he, he goes on and says, it wouldn't have made sense to people at the time, but millions of people today would recognize it as a description of quantum mechanics. And imagine how many fence sitters would convert to Christianity after hearing about this amazing piece of scientific knowledge in an ancient religious book. Then he gives another example. We'll cover these examples in a sec. I just want to read it in full, in context. Thou shalt boil thy water, lest the invisible creatures therein bring sickness upon your body. I like how he writes it in King James. Um, Anyway, Uh, invisible creatures living in the water and making people sick. This would have sounded very odd to people in ancient times. But you know what? Not only would it impress modern day readers, it would have saved millions of lives. Why, why didn't Jesus warn people about germs? Okay, so this is number six, um, which is number five, but in a slightly different form. The Bible should contain knowledge that humans couldn't have had. Here's a couple problems I have with this. A lot of the times, the examples that Matt gives that, because prophecy, he already agreed prophecy is a sufficient example and we have that in the Bible. So to me, the question's answered if prophecy's there. Even if there's no scientific insights in the Bible of any kind, we have information that comes from the mind of God, not man. But 
his examples, the suggestions that he gives, they will backfire a lot of the time. Because the truth is, Matt only seems to care about God reaching 21st century Matt and not 13th century monks or 9th century, you know, Buddhists or or go back further and further into different cultures and different people in different time periods. It doesn't matter to him that that writing that he's suggesting might cause people to reject the Bible for hundreds and hundreds of years just so that he'll accept it nowadays today. So that's why prophecy is a better, a better example for this. Prophecy is like, no, no, here's an event that'll happen and then we just wait and see and it happens and you accept the Bible. But let's... Um, Let's look at another problem. Um, our current understanding where we describe waves and particles everywhere and nowhere. Well, first off, if that was in the Bible, let, let's bring it up again. If this is in the Bible, this phrase, the pieces that make up our Lord's creation believe, uh, behave as both particles and waves existing everywhere and nowhere. Would not the skeptic say that the Bible is contradicting itself here? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't this be an example that occurred earlier when you said the Bible had contradictions? It's contradiction everywhere and nowhere. It can't exist everywhere and nowhere. But there's another problem is that the skeptics would say this. They'd say, well, sure. You know, the Bible for thousands of years said the said the pieces of the Lord's creation uh, exist everywhere and nowhere in particles and waves. But what happened was scientists, when they discovered quantum mechanics, they just named those things particles and they named them waves because they were Christians. And so then they would just wipe it under the table and say, who cares? Nope, not evidence. This was just them copying the Bible. I, that's, I'm confident that this is exactly what would... There'd be articles on the websites dismissing it for that very reason. Um, also, our description of quantum mechanics may change in the next however many years. It may shift and change. And so that's why prophecy is better than scientific insights because scientific insights are constantly changing and will only be... What will be loved by one culture will be hated by another because they don't have that information. Um, but all that being said... The Bible does make some scientific statements. So I'll give you one example. In Genesis 1, the first words of the Bible are, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's the standard Jewish, ancient Jewish understanding and Christian understanding that this meant the Bible, that the Bible was saying that worlds were all created out of nothing, that the universe didn't exist and then it existed. So it was just God and then all of a sudden, he, in fact, the description in Genesis 1, how he spoke it into existence is, I think, to really draw out and point out that this is a speaking into existence. He didn't fashion it. He spoke it. There's really the wording there is interesting. Hebrews, later on in the, in the New Testament, Hebrews affirms this even more strongly. Hebrews 11.3, it says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Um the Greek there is really interesting, the way it's worded in the Greek, which is why it comes off a little odd in English. But it's saying that the stuff that you see, matter, it was not made up of matter. It was it was just made, but not made out, out of any any stuff that we can see. And so here it's really saying God spoke it into existence. It was created by the Hebrews 11.3, word of God. He spoke it into existence. So this is something that was disputed and disagree with even in the 20th century. In the early 20th century, the the over our, the overwhelming like majority of physicists, they would say that the universe had always existed, that it was eternal eternal past. So there was no moment of creation. But sure enough, when they discovered, you know, Hubble's discovered Hubble discovered the redshift in the galaxies, Einstein with his equations and stuff, they basically and some other work other smart people were doing, they said, "Hey, the universe has a beginning." And, um, and now some people are still arguing about this, but that's the scientific prediction in the Bible that the universe has a beginning. So it's still there. I, I just think the utility of this is not as useful as prophecy, but it is there. It is there. The other example he gives uh, is really interesting as well for secret knowledge is that um, it'd be nice if the Bible said, you know, boil water, lest invisible creatures therein bring sickness upon you. Let's imagine for a second if the Bible did say this and let's just carry it out to its logical conclusion. What would you as a skeptic say if you opened the Bible and this verse was in there? Wouldn't you just say, oh, invisible creatures, that was talking about spirits. And chances are ancient people would interpret it as spirits because that's what they would think of invisible creatures. I mean, they're spirit creatures. They're in the water. You have to boil them out. Um, you know, it's like the sumo wrestler. He throws salt and stamps his foot on the ground before the sumo match to scare the bad spirits away. Like that's the tradition. I mean, most of them probably don't believe that, but that's, that's how it started. 
So you're boiling the water to scare the bad spirits away. It would just be that it was convenient. This is what the skeptic would say. The Bible, it's just convenient that the Bible told them to boil water. Somebody back then must have noticed that boiled water didn't get people sick. So then this would just be thrown away. It'd be washed away, whitewashed away, just like the other example he gave. And I guarantee you, Matt would not accept this as evidence for the Bible's inspiration. He would just call it coincidence. But the Old Testament laws actually have several such things in them. And Matt doesn't seem to care or doesn't know, maybe he doesn't know, um, that that there was things that the, the Hebrews were told to avoid, right? They were told to avoid basically scavenger animals, animals that were more likely to carry disease. They were told not to eat them. Um, shellfish, pork, things like that, that were have higher rates of infections. They were told to wash. And in fact, they were given a recipe for water to be used for ceremonial cleansing. And the recipe is for making soap. Like, Go read it on your own. You're like, this is a recipe for making soap. And God's like, use this for your ceremonial cleansing. So God's putting into, into them like modern, um, not, not identically modern, but, but basically things that comport with a modern understanding of sanitary safety. They had to defecate outside the camp. They couldn't even poop or pee inside the camp. They had to go all the way outside the camp. And these are things um, that are in the Bible. So what I'm saying here is, Matt, the Bible has both of the things that you're asking for. In the sense of prophecy, in the sense of scientific understanding, there's evidence of that in the Bible. And these are the only two things I'd say that you've given that actually matter. So by, by Matt's standards, the Bible is God's word. By Matt's standards. Now, as the article continues, we've got another... Uh, Another little pot shot. Okay, this isn't this isn't number one, two, three, four, five, six. This isn't seven. This is just a pot shot. Like sometimes these happen. It's just like, and on a side note, I found a cool meme I want to share with you. And so he just throws it in there. So he says, I would add that oddly enough, and I want you to think, how does this relate to inspiration? Everything described in the Bible takes place in the geographical area that its authors knew or knew about. That's understandable, but okay. I think he thinks he's making a really important point which happens to be a comparatively tiny patch of earth, though God made man, uh, made Europe and the Americas and Asia, all of which teemed with the life he created. He forgot to mention any of it to his stenographers. Um, they weren't stenographers, but um, then there's the meme here. It says every single action of the God of God in the Bible, the Quran and the Torah took place in that little circle. There you go. That little circle. Okay. So <laughs> let me answer this one. Um, this is, this is why I do YouTube. Okay. This is, this is inanity, not insanity. It's inanity. It's inanity. It's inane. This is not reality. This is just memes and sarcasm and mockery and misrepresentations and special pleading and red herrings all crammed together into an attack on the Bible. If it was true that everything God did was inside that little circle, what would it prove? Nothing. It has nothing to do with the inspiration of scripture. But what if, what if the Bible had named the Americas? What if in the Bible somewhere it said, there is North and South America and Greenland and Iceland, and you will one day go to the, I don't know why I mentioned Iceland there, but, and you will one day visit all these places, you know, and, and make colonies there. And so then colonizers, they go across and they come to America and they name it North America and South America. And the skeptic says, you just named it that because the Bible said those names. And then they dismiss the evidence because never discount people's ability to ignore evidence. Um, but nor is it accurate. The meme's not accurate, right? When the Bible talks about God creating the universe, God making all the living things, all of the ground, all of the water, all of the space, all of the sky, everything that exists, he's obviously ignoring that, ignoring the fact that the Bible talks about God creating all things and all people. And so um, that would be what you call special pleading. So every action of God in the Bible takes place in that circle, except for all the actions of God in the Bible that take place outside that circle, actions which I will, I will conveniently ignore so that I can attack the Bible and go, ha ha, because that's what I'm really after is the ha ha moment, but not about reasoning or thinking. Um, it's a little frustrating uh, and people swallow this stuff and then they go and share it with their coworkers and their friends and they share it on social media. And it's just, it's, it's the blind leading the blind. Not to mention the Bible has literally gone throughout all the earth. Like go back to the, let's go back to this map. What if this map was representative of where the gospel and the Bible has gone, where the message of Jesus has gone throughout all the world, it would be a lot bigger. The circle would be the size of the earth pretty much. Um, 
the, not to mention the gospel is without borders. This, this message coming from a, a, a relatively small group of Jewish people in ancient times, but speaking about God's love and protection, provision, and, and um, gospel of grace going out to all of mankind. The gospel is very inclusive and cares very deeply. God cares deeply for all people. So, I'm sorry, Matt's wrong on everything. And here's the next one. Uh, number seven. It would have been beautiful, it would have, excuse me, the Bible, if it was inspired, would have beautiful, heart-rending poetry and stories. Heart-rending poetry and stories. Can I just point out again, this has nothing to do with inspiration, right? Like, like do you think Shakespeare is inspired by God because it's beautiful or heart-rending? Um, this must be what, when the article says six and a half reasons, this must be the half, or maybe that's just clickbait. Um, but... Beautiful, heart-rending poetry. So then it gives examples. Um, let, let's read through it. It says, Not as convincing as the others, I think. Beauty being in the eye of the beholder is neither objectively present nor measurable. Millions of people find the scripture exquisitely written. In the Netherlands, a well-known secular novelist once told me that he liked to read the Bible to cleanse his literary palate with its beauty. Okay, then. To each his own. But I do not understand. or I, I, But I do understand where Matt is coming from. Okay, so the... The, the person who kind of like took Matt's article and adapted it for Pythagoras, this, this writer, they, they have all these like disclaimers, these caveats, because it pretty much, Seven starts by saying, yeah, the Bible's not, not, it doesn't have beautifully written poetry, and it obviously should, and then it goes on to explain, of course, millions of people think the Bible is beautifully written and well done. In fact, I know of someone who's a professional in the field who says that it is, and, and so, and so, um, it's like, why did you even include... In fact, that must be why it's considered a half a reason. Because they just thought it wasn't very good. So I agree. And I give you props for at least at least degrading it to a half a reason. So let's look at the example. It says, in Judges 19, 22 through 30. Now this is, again, what we call special pleading. Special pleading is where I take... Uh, and I, I isolate an example that, uh, that proves my point, And I ignore all the examples that don't prove my point, And that's what happens here. So... Um, so in Judges 19, 22 through 23, it says an old man takes in a traveling Levite. Later, a group of men who want to rape the traveler come to the old man's house and beat on his door. The old man offers them his daughter and concubine instead. So the men take the concubine and rape her all night. The next morning, the old man finds the concubine who is still alive. Um, that's not what the text says, by the way. Um, that's just something he added there. Uh, chops her into 12 pieces and sends them to the 12 tribes of Israel. The story ends with the words, consider of it, take advice and speak your minds. What are we supposed to make of this horrible story? What's the point? Um, okay. This is just, again, another case of misrepresenting the Bible. Some, not always, but honestly, frequently. Okay. If you're a skeptic, hear me. This is, I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor and I'm a Bible studier, right? Like I study the scriptures and I study them in context and I have a personal moral conviction that it's wrong to misrepresent any text or any person, especially the word of God. So I feel like I have to try to understand it in context. So my message to skeptics is this. If you casually and willy nilly misrepresent the Bible and take things out of context, then you're no better than any cult group that's out there. And that's exactly what Matt does here. It's a shame. It's a shame for your reasoning. It, it's embarrassing. In my opinion, you should be embarrassed if you're going to misrepresent the Bible in order to attack it. But I see it happen a lot. So in Judges 19, um, is this a poem? No. So it doesn't apply to the issue of poetry. Is it a heart-rending story? Yes, actually. Do you feel your heart rend as we read about the horrible things that happen? I mean, the context of the book of Judges is that it shows the tragedy of sin as Israel continually gets worse and worse and worse. And the hard thing is teaching the end of Judges. I've taught through Judges. Teaching the, the it's not online, but the last chapters of Judges is difficult because it's showing you how depraved Israel became and how much they turned from God. And you, you read the stories and there is no good guy because they're trying to show you how bad Israel has become. Um, so aside from the, the misrepresentation suggesting that the woman was still alive, that's not what the text says. Um, and because uh, it never says he kills her. It, anyway, that's not what the text says. You can do I'm not going to do a whole careful verse by verse study of this little passage for my point today. You're welcome to do it on your own. But the other misrepresentation is it's not the end of the story that says consider of it, take advice and speak your minds. That's not even part of a 
an admonition in Judges, that phrase, consider of it, take advice, speak your minds, is what the man says to the other tribes of Israel. And then as you read in chapter 20, they respond and a whole bunch of other stuff happens in 20, 21. The story is not over. Matt wants you to think that the Bible's going, look, he chopped her up. Think about it and take advice. Like this is, this is just irritatingly wrong. It's like so bad to take the Bible and twist it or any text or any person and misrepresent them like this, you're delighting in deceit if you do this. So is the Bible poetic? Does the Bible have poetry in it? Well, yes. Um, it's hard to read the Bible and not notice the poetry. Genesis chapter one is poetry. Um, the Song of Solomon is a poet is a poem about romantic love. The book of Proverbs is full of witty, clever poetry. Like I like, it's even funny poetry. Like as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And if you've ever owned a dog and you've seen him do that, then you, <laughs> you get the visual. Um, there's m many songs that are in the Bible, not to mention the countless songs inspired by the Bible and how even when I hear them, just the parts that are scriptural are the ones that really blow my heart away. Um, the Beatitudes is considered uh, a beautiful moral poem by Jesus. The Song of Solomon, um, I already mentioned that. The, the heart-rending passage of Isaiah 53 that literally brings people to tears on a regular basis. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is, was upon him. Uh, by his stripes we are healed. Like, is it beautiful? Yes. Now you say beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but there's a very large number of beholders that behold the beauty in the Bible. And this even goes to non-believers. This is why non-believers who don't believe the Bible will quote it at funerals for its poetic beauty to share at those times. So the poetry of grief, um, oh, like read by the rivers of Babylon. Um, when they asked us to sing songs of, of, of Jerusalem and we hung our harps upon the willows. I mean, just if you study through the poetic passages, they're beautiful. Now, do they rhyme? No, they don't rhyme. Uh, they're also not in English originally. <laughs> and, uh, but, but no, the, the, the poetry is often parallelisms and conceptual poetry. It's much more intelligent and thoughtful poetry than that stuff. And it's powerful stuff. Um, this is a really subjective argument, number seven. But there are, in fact, books written on poetry in the Bible. The Art of Biblical Poetry by Robert Alter. The Reading Biblical Poetry by uh, J.P. Fokelman. These are, these are things you can study. You can actually go to college and get your, get your um, education on the topics of biblical poetry. So, so yeah. Yeah. The Bible. The Bible definitely passes that. So we have been given seven reasons. Seven reasons that the Bible is not inspired. And literally every single reason is not true. Five of the reasons they misrepresent the Bible and they aren't related to inspiration. Meaning that while the Bible has those five things, poetry and organization and clarity and all this other stuff, I, um, I would not use those as reasons to prove it's inspired, but it does have them. Then we have six and five, those two things, which are really just one reason, knowledge from God, not man. And that is the reason to believe the Bible is inspired of God and the Bible does have those. So, um, how does he close the article? And then I'm going to take your guys' questions. Put them in the, uh, the uh, comment section. I'm about to, to jump on and do your guys' questions if you're still with me. If you're with me. This has been a long, drawn-out thing. But I think this will really help people who struggle with these issues. They read these articles and it freaks them out. So, he concludes this way. In short, if God wanted to make his presence conclusively known through scripture, he could have and should have done a lot better than the Bible. I disagree. Um, the good news is it's not too late. If the Almighty really wants to get his message across with inc incontestable ch clarity, I hope he'll entertain a suggestion. Um, actually, we, we don't know that he wants to get it off with incontestable clarity. We just know that he we, we can verify that it is inspired. Um, uh, that's another issue there. Um, here's the suggestion. He could easily make a hundred towering thousand foot tall black granite slabs appear overnight in a hundred major cities across the world. The surface of each unique slab would be literally aglow with words from a magical pre babble lingua franca language of the people that each of us can somehow read with absolute comprehension. The text would enter our minds and be available for errorless instant recall. Whenever we wanted, they would speak of morality and ethics in ways that to our collective joy and relief force an end to the fact fractious debates over gay rights, abortion, euthanasia, and a range of other divisive topics. The 100 texts combined would con haunt, would constitute Bible 2.0, a perfect everlasting globally understood 
masterpiece created by the obvious Lord of the Universe. That's great. God just has to wait until we have video cameras and uh, and we have uh, you know some sort of live streaming content online so we can really show it's all happening and then have some sort of way of proving it isn't a conspiracy and then proving it wasn't aliens messing with us and proving it wasn't the government. Um, but unfortunately, that won't work for the most the majority of humanity who lived before our time where those sorts of things would conveniently work. Or we could just take what God's done and we can let it stand. So the uh, the skeptics... I want to know how they respond. Um, so, uh, AJ, if you could send me those questions over. And if you have a question, throw it into our, our comments section. We've, uh, we've covered today this article from uh, patheos.com or .org. I, 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 sorry, I honestly just forgot the exact dot. Um, six and a half reasons why the Bible is not divinely inspired. And we've gone through every one of the reasons. And I'm not trying to attack it in, in irrational ways. I'm just showing you what I see when I study through this article and it's embarrassing. Um, the reasoning is bad. And now I would never speak so harshly if I just had a one-on-one -on -one talk with Matt. Never. One-on-one, -on -one, I would be much more gracious and much more like just kind of like asking him questions and trying to pull stuff out and being more amicable. But this is a battle of ideas and I need to show how bad these ideas are for everybody else's sake. So uh, let's go to your guys' questions. From um, Solo Spiritus 70 AD, it says, a question for Mike. If Christ had the victory at the cross, is it possible that Satan cast out into the lake of, uh, Satan is cast out into the lake of fire? Oh, give me one moment. I just got a bunch more messages there. Um, oh, wait. Okay, just a second. I don't know what happened with my messenger app, but I, it just shot all over the place. Okay. So, um, is it possible that Christ, uh, that, that Satan is cast out into the lake of fire um, because of the victory Jesus already had? Could it be that he is just a puppet for the darkness? Um, the, I don't think it's possible that Satan is cast into the lake of fire yet. Um, that's his final destination, and I don't believe that has happened yet. I, I, don't, I think there might be some preterists who think that's already happened, but, um, but only some of them would. Um, I think probably a lot of them wouldn't. But in Revelation, that's like his final destination place. He's actually currently roaming around the earth. Um, in Jesus' letter uh, to, I think it's Pergamos, he says that that's where Satan's throne is in that particular city in the book of Revelation. So we're talking here after the cross. He says that Satan's throne is there in that city. Um, Jesus, when he goes to the cross, he says that Satan has asked for Peter that he might sift him as wheat. But afterwards, that when he returns... And so we get this idea that Satan's activity is continuing um, and going on right now. So that, la that lake of fire thing I, I see is happening after the tribulation, after the millennium, and then the final judgment. That's, that's my understanding of the eschatology of it. And from Decided Scroll, could you ask Mike if we should take 1 Corinthians 7.12 as inspired if of God, since it says it's Paul's opinion? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, pull this up real quick. 1 Corinthians 7, 12, Paul, I believe, is talking, as I'm loading it up, Paul is talking about uh, relationships, and he mentioned something that's really interesting, and I've heard some interesting takes on this. He says that it's his opinion, uh, but, but the way he says it's really curious. So I've gone back and forth in my own mind. Like, I used to think um, it was just Paul's opinion, don't worry about it, but I'm not 100% sure. So let's read it. It says, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord. I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Isn't that interesting? I, not the Lord. Okay, let me now read it in context and then I'm going to give you a couple possible interpretations of this passage. So this is about marriage and divorce. So 1 Corinthians 7, I'll start in verse 10. He says, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. So Paul's saying, this is from the Lord. The wife should not separate her uh, from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Now, that's the, this is from the Lord one, and then verse 12 comes, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. A couple options that are available here. Uh, one possibility is that uh, Paul, when he says, I, not the Lord, he, he means... Just my opinion, 
it's just a wisdom. It's just a, hey, here's a wisdom thing. Um, or it could mean um, that I don't have any specific teaching from Jesus on this, but I, Paul the Apostle, have a command for you. So when he first says, the Lord says, he's referring specifically to Jesus. Like Paul's actually carrying traditions of what Jesus has taught and he knows it and he's putting it into his letter because certainly Jesus shared more than what we have in the gospels. Um, and so maybe when he says the Lord, he means Jesus. So when he says not the Lord, he, he's like, here's my teaching. No, this isn't directly from the mouth of Jesus, but it's from Paul the apostle, which still carries the apostolic weight. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure on it. Ever since I heard, um, that second view that I just mentioned, I've, I've gone, huh, I want to go back when I get back around to first Corinthians and restudy the passage and look at it again. Uh, one of these days I'll do a whole thing on marriage and uh, I'm looking forward to it, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to be one of these days. I, I have a long laundry list of topics I want to cover online. So, so there you go. Sorry to uh, give you a confusion there, but at least it tells you some options you can consider as you study the passage from big O. Why do we need to study the Bible if God said he would write his word on our hearts? Thanks for your time. P.S. I do realize the irony of using the Bible as an authority to undermine its authority. <laughs> that's, that's a good point there. Um, so he'd write his word on our hearts. Um, I, I, I take his word on our hearts to be God's commands to us, what he wants from us. He'll write it on, on our hearts. Um, but now if you combine this together with other New Testament ideas... It doesn't mean that we, we will have the Bible memorized because if that was, I'll put it this way, if I didn't need the Bible, then it would be because written on my heart meant I know the Bible by heart. So I wouldn't need it because I would have it in my heart because I would just quote it off the top of my head, the entire Bible. So the only time you could say, I don't need the Bible is when you can finally quote the whole thing by heart, in which case you have it in your heart. So the, there you go. His word in your heart. If, if the word is the Bible, you got to memorize the whole thing before that verse is fulfilled. Uh, in addition to that, we have the, the fact that um, I have the flesh and I can be deceived. And so his word is written in my heart. His Holy Spirit is guiding me, but my flesh also pulls at me. My own mind can sometimes deceive me. The world can trick me. I can sometimes trip down other paths. And so the word of God is this perfect discerner between the thoughts and intents of the heart and mind and that I can use as a sword to make clarity in those hard times. So that would be my, my thought there. Um, from uh, Ha Iesus and I, uh, I think it should be Ha Kurias, but it's just Ah Kurias, but maybe I'm wrong. Mas, anyway, from that, that's the name of the guy <laughs> um, in the Greek. You got to give me like a nickname for you when you're when you're online here, just for the sake of that. I'll just call you Greeky. Um, are there any essential beliefs shown in the Bible that are relatively hard to understand by the common Christian, not a scholar, or PhD, or historian, or pastor for that matter? Um, there. Yes and no. So there are some beliefs which, when you want to understand them very deeply, it's very difficult. But when you want to understand them very casually, it's very simple. Oh, God is, you know, Jesus is God. The Father's God. The Holy Spirit is God. There's only one God. And the Father's not the Spirit. Like, I okay. But this is something that most people have a hard time when they really try to go deeply into it. But the simplicity of it, I think. So I, I would think of it as levels of understanding. Um, how well you understand it. You know, I, like I understand that when I flip the lights on that it turns my electricity on and most people get that, but do I really understand like where that electricity came from and how it was generated and how it was stored and what happens to the unused electricity? Like, I don't understand all that stuff. So we can have a simple understanding of complicated things. That would be my, my thoughtful answer to that. And, uh, from Greeky again, um, it's, uh, what was the point of your last, your latest video? Okay. So I'm glad you brought that up. My, my last video was actually a video of a student in my church. His name's Luke, who is organizing a student walkout for his school, La Salle High School. So here in Southern California, Los Alamitos High School. And this walkout is going to be a bunch of kids. They're not, they're not even leaving school campus, right? But they're doing a organized, and they have permission to do this from administration. They're doing an organized demonstration against abortion and to bring the pro-life cause to their students, their fellow students, as well as teachers, and just take advantage of their freedom of speech. And so I want to support him as much as I can. So I helped them make the video and I put it up on my YouTube channel. It's actually an international thing. And I know of at least 70, 70 different schools that are doing it, or at least it's national. I don't know if it's international um, and maybe more, probably more that just I haven't been aware of. So yeah, I encourage you guys to go check it out. Maybe give it a like, give it a share. It's tomorrow is the walkout and I'm hoping it becomes a yearly thing. Um, and no, they're not actually walking out of school. So it's kind of tricky the way they're wording it. 
Okay, so from BC Bloyd, um, or BCB Lloyd. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Love your channel. Speaking of prophecy, forgive me if you've covered this in another video, but what about Matthew 2.23? What prophets is Matthew talking about Jesus Nazarene? Um, okay, let me bring up that passage. Just handling your questions one at a time. If you have another one, you're welcome to put it in the comments section, especially if you think something I said today was just totally stupid. Like I would love to hear it actually. And I will handle, handle you graciously when you do. Um, so it says, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Okay. So, um, this is, a, is subject to debate. It might come from, uh, Isaiah, the passage that says, um, it uses a, it, oh, you know what? I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it uses the word Netzer in the Hebrew. If, in fact, AJ could probably correct me on this because he's he's studying Hebrew now. Um, it uses the word Netzer to describe uh, something about the Messiah, and so Matthew may be making a connection between that 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 Hebrew word Netzer and then Nazarene. He's from Nazareth, and so it's just saying he would be called a Nazarene. So to understand this, you have to understand different types of prophetic fulfillment. There's the there's the prophecy that's fulfilled, like, here's a prediction, clear prediction, here's a clear fulfillment. That, that kind of prophecy is really good for proving um, that the Bible is God's word. There's other prophecies that are like, here's a foreshadowing, here's a fulfillment, not as useful for proving that the Bible is inspired, but very useful for helping us see the integrated nature of the Bible, very useful for us maybe understanding why Jesus did what he did, why he appeared where he appeared. It's explanatory. It's just not apologetic in that sense. So I would I would couch that fulfilled prophecy as explanatory, but not apologetic, if that makes sense. There's other ones that are more apologetic. So I wouldn't quote this Nazareth one when I'm trying to witness to a skeptic and share with them biblical prophecy. I specially selected biblical prophecies in my evidence for the Bible series that I felt were those kinds of prophecies. So, um, yeah, so... And I, I think that AJ might've put something in the comments there to help you guys out, but th that's all I got off the top of my head. I, I can't remember right now, but if you, if you research it a little on your own, you'll find the same thing. That's, that's one possible explanation for what Matthew was getting at there. Um, okay. Let's take another question. We have from fly fishing, Michigan. Oh man, that sounds really fun. I've never been fly fishing. I'd probably hook my nose, but it does. Sound fun. Uh, Mike, do you believe the Bible's text has been perfectly preserved? Like most, most Muslims believe about the Quran. Uh, no, not, not in that sense, right? So I believe the Bible's text has been sufficiently preserved, um, but perfectly preserved, no. If by perfectly, you mean every letter, every name, every single thing totally unchanged in our um, most ancient manuscripts or whatever, the manuscripts themselves dif dis differ and disagree. But is it largely preserved? Yes. And so I have a video called, um, what you, and this is literally the title of the video. It's called what you need to know about the 400,000 variants in the Bible, what you need to know about the 400,000 variants in the Bible. And I, I recommend watching that if you'd like to hear more details on that. So, um, perfectly preserved. No. Um, and that freaks people out sometimes because the Bible's perfect. The Bible's perfect, but be patient, think it through carefully. And you'll see how this is not an issue at all. Um, and, and I explain in the video, I deal with all that stuff. Um, so another question from uh, Greeky says, may you do a live stream like this on the growing group called the Hebrew Israelites? Okay, I mean, you know, if I don't want to get a lot of death threats, maybe I don't want to do that, but I'm familiar with that group. Um, I have actually haven't studied their stuff and in my own life haven't encountered really hardly anybody who's influenced by them. So I haven't felt like a real need to do that. Um, there is There are a few channels that are doing that stuff. Um, uh, James White did a debate with one of the black Hebrew Israelite groups representatives and just, just demolished the lies that they were bringing. And also, um, a guy named vocab Malone, you can look up online. He has a ton of stuff on there. And if you guys know of other sites that deal with this stuff, YouTube channels, please put them in the comments section just to give you a reference to something since I haven't done that and don't plan on doing it anytime soon. Um, yeah. Okay, from Ryan Tanner, my good friend Ryan Tanner, says a lot of Christians, myself included, would say that the whole transgender issue is one of mental illness. So how do we call it sin? We do not consider other illness sin. How do we reconcile both? Um, 
I guess, okay, so like, let's say that you were self-delusional. Like, like, let me say, I'll, I'll put it this way. I don't think it's an issue of sin versus illness. Um, first off, when we use the phrase mental illness, it gets a little muddy because mental illness is obviously not the same as a physical illness, but they aren't unrelated entirely. They're just not the same thing. It just gets confusing and complicated. But let's suppose I had a mental illness and in my mental illness, I believe I'm hearing voices and these voices are telling me that I'm God and that I'm the creator. And then, and then that Jesus is my enemy because he's tried to convince people that he was a God. And so it may be triggered by a mental illness that might be incorporated into my delusions, but my delusions themselves are causing me to take actions and have attitudes against God. So it's both it's here's illness and sin. Um, but transgender is, I don't know if I, I don't know. I don't know if I call it a mental illness or not, but, but the idea that you are not really the gender that you are is, is delusional at its core. Like that's, that's the nature of delusion. It's like, I, I have an idea in my head that doesn't match reality. And I'm trying to seek for ways to support this idea, to, to try to make it a reality or to at least make it look more real, you know, with changes that I can make physically. And this breaks my heart because I've known people who are in these, in this situation and they generally do have a lot of other struggles and issues and, and hardships. Generally speaking though, it's like we're, we're, we're caught here where we, Let's not make it about sin. Let's make it about truth, right? Where we have to say, do I compromise truth and pretend that your delusion is real so that you won't get mad at me or people won't vilify me? Or do I tell you, hey man, can I help you? Can we talk about this? Can we discuss this? In fact, in California, we're now under threat for trying to help people come out of uh, ungodly and untrue and unrealistic lifestyles um, with legislation that's coming across, which is really unfortunate. So I I, I just feel like, Ryan, to say, to, to muddy the waters more for you, um, we don't pick between mental illness and sin. We say, okay, maybe there is some sort of mental illness, whatever you mean by that. There's delusion. There's mental delusion that's on going on here. But then there's a conscious decision to live in deception. And that ends up being related to sin in some very real ways. Um, so sorry for making things more confusing. But that's how it is in my head. So um, from Falcon R 56 it says, Mike, what do you think about eyes to see and ears to hear? Does that apply to reading scripture too? For those chosen as opposed to those foolish ones. Um, that almost sounds like we're talking here about kind of like a Calvinistic sort of view of election. Maybe you're not. I'm just trying to I have a little bit of information from your question here. What do I think about eyes to see and ears to hear? Um, let's say we could put them on a sliding spectrum, right? You have eyes that are wide open and ears that are wide open. You have eyes that are utterly closed and ears that are utterly closed. And let's suppose that people can be moving on the spectrum sort of closer to the open and closer to the closed. And now it seems to fit more situations to me, right? We have those who utterly reject Christ and the evidence and the truth and the, the, the preaching they're given, their eyes are closed, their ears are closed to it. And then we have those who receive it and they listen and they're, they're going to take it in. Um, that would be how I understand that concept. Um, but your question is, does that apply to reading scripture too for those chosen? Um, I, I don't think it means they can't understand scripture, but it, I think it means they can't hear it in the sense of applying it into their lives. So it may even be, no, I read it. I see what it's saying. Like I have to believe in Jesus. Like I, I see that it's saying that, but I don't hear it. I won't hear it. So it may not just be understanding. It may also be a the willingness to tolerate the truth of God. And then we have a question from Joe D. Di Pilato. Uh, it says, Bible scholars recently concluded that the story about he who is without sin cast the first stone was not in the original text. Can you please speak to this? So I do actually speak to this in more detail in one of my videos in the evidence for the Bible series um, where I deal with Bible variations that matter or something along those lines. It's the one that comes right after the video on 400,000 variants. But if you, if you look up, um, Mike Winger and then Google Mike Winger, um, and then that passage or, uh, the phrase adultery, I know that sounds weird, but Mike Winger and adultery, you'll get it because it's in the woman, the woman caught in adultery in that passage. I think you'll find it on, on Google or maybe someone can, uh, can do that. So I deal with that there and the, the overwhelming majority right now of the scholars are saying, yeah, we don't think that this passage is in the original. Um, we do think that this was a real 
like ancient word of mouth story about Jesus. And so they think it has historicity, but that it was not originally in John's gospel. And because the story was going around, they were looking for somewhere to put it along with the other stories about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so it moves around in the texts in the ancient manuscripts. Sometimes it's in one place, sometimes it's in another. And um, that's my understanding of it. Though some, especially if you're King James only, you're like really mad at me right now, but I hope that you would have some grace in your heart toward me. Um, yeah, so I, I deal with that one in detail in that video. What I'll do after I'm done is I'll go and add that video to the video description uh, for this video. So uh, if there's any other um, uh, questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I think we're done with the Q&A. And, &A. and I'll, I'll give you guys um, one last update because I keep getting questions about one thing. The one thing people all want to know about is, Mike, when is your Flat Earth video coming out? And I don't know. Uh, but I will say this. My, my personal schedule has been very busy. And there's some videos that require me to do, say, like this video today. I probably spent, you know, 15 or 20 hours, maybe, maybe, maybe less, about, about 15 hours, I guess, preparing this video today just for this live stream. And I can do that. Some videos, though, they require... 40, 60, 80, 100 hours of preparation. And so depending on my schedule, where I can cram those hours, that pushes that video further out. And this Flat Earth video is going to get pushed out quite a bit. The more I'm looking into it, the more it's going to get pushed out. So I'm sorry, you'll have to be patient with me. Help spread the word. So everyone stops asking me about it. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, yeah, okay. So I do have, I think, one other question here. Thanks again, AJ, for being there uh, for this ministry. Really appreciate it. Um, he says, also... From, oh, this is from RCCGC, and I hope that that's not your actual full name. Um, also, I've been wondering almost as if Paul breaks down the gospel of Jesus, how does he know so much about Jesus? Oh, um, okay. I think I understand your question. How does Paul know so much about Jesus? Well, Paul was was contemporary with Jesus. Uh, he probably didn't meet, I mean, as far as my, to my knowledge, didn't meet him before the crucifixion, or maybe he met him in passing. Nothing's mentioned about it. But he did spend, over the course of those years of ministry, he spent a lot of time with those who did know Jesus. And so he had two things, according to the scripture. He had personal private revelation from the Lord to himself, where God taught him things. But then he also had the stories and the information he got from the apostles when he met with them. He met with Peter and James. Another time he met with all of the apostles that were available. And so he had gotten a lot of information from them. So Paul had like three sources that we're aware of for information about Jesus. You know, his private revelation, uh, the people that he would come in, run into, as well as the other apostles that would share with him about those things. So Paul had a lot of information uh, going around. Uh, so I think that, I think that answers all the questions. So thank you guys so much for uh, for coming out and supporting the live stream. I plan on doing it again next week. I'm still debating a little bit on what I'm going to do. I have a couple ideas, but I'm afraid to say something out loud and then change my mind later. So I'll just keep it to myself. If you have video ideas or suggestions for future videos, feel free to put those in the comment section. And forgive me if I don't have time to reply to all the comments or even all the private messages right now. Um, by the grace of God, this, this, what, this online ministry is reaching thousands and thousands more people than it did even three or four months ago and it's just been kind of exploding in a good way thank you lord but it means that it's harder and harder for me to keep up with everything because if i answer every comment or reply to every private message i won't even have time to study so so i'm just trying to make wise decisions on on how to do all that and uh, make good use of my time so god bless you guys uh thank you so much for being here until next time uh don't forget to check the context please when uh, when people attack the bible come against the scriptures say something sarcastic hit pause go look it up Think it through and you will probably see right through it.